Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. What we're going to be talking about today is quantum physics. In fact, we are going to be revising the whole of the OCR Physics A specification on quantum physics. However, the actual content is applicable to all exam boards on the A levels. Now, let's get started. First off, in quantum physics, we're dealing mainly with the particle nature of light. So, the first thing that we need to revise is that light arrives in particles. Particles. These are packets of energies called photons. The energy of the photon is given by two possible equations. One of them is E is equal to hf, where h is Planck's constant 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34. Given the fact that frequency is related to the wavelength by the speed of light, so c will be equal to f times the wavelength, where f is the frequency. For to rearrange for the frequency, we get that the frequency is equal to c over the wavelength. So if we were to sub this equation in here, we are going to get our second equation for the um, for the energy of a photon, which is that e is equal to hc over lambda. Let's use those two equations to calculate the energies of a couple of photons. So let's start off and calculate the fre frequency of a photon with, let's say, energy 5.45 times 10 to the power of 14 hertz. Because we're given the frequency, what I'm going to do is use E is equal to hf. So let's do that. E is equal to hf. So this will be equal to 6.63 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 34 multiplied by the frequency, which is equal to 5.45 times 10 to the power of 14 hertz, giving us 3.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. For the second question, we have a photon of a wavelength of 400 nanometers. So what we need to do is uh, use our second equation, which is E is equal to HC divided by lambda. H is once again Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 times the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8. Then we're going to be dividing that by the wavelength, which is 400 nanometers, which is 400 times 10 to the power of minus 9. And when we plug this into a calculator, we are going to get 4.97, so 4.97 times 10 to the power of minus 19, which is essentially about 5 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. Just before we move on, let's work out the base unit of H which is the Planck's constant. As we know, E is equal to hf, so this means that Planck's constant will be equal to the energy divided by the frequency. Now, the energy is measured in joules, and frequency is measured fundamentally in 1 over time, which means that it's 1 over seconds, which means that we can write this as seconds to a power of minus 1. Now, a joule is uh, essentially kilograms meters squared divided by seconds squared. How do I know this? I normally just derive this straight out of E is equal to a half mv squared. Uh, the half has no units. The meters have the, the uh, mass has the units of kilograms and the speed has units of meters squared divided by seconds squared. So when I substitute this into the joule, I know that the joule per s to the power of minus 1 will be equal to kilograms meter squared s to the power of minus 2 divided by seconds to the power of minus 1. So dividing by s to the power of minus 1 is the same as multiplying by a second just from the property of powers, which leads us to a final base unit for h, which is kilograms meter squared s to the power of minus 1. Please don't try to memorize, to memorize this, but the best way to tackle this problem is just to ensure that you can go through this working out.
Now that we've uh, discussed the base unit, let's uh, introduce a new unit, which is the, or let's revise a new unit, which is the electron volt. So you're going to notice that all of these energies that we calculated are quite small numbers. So in quantum mechanics, we're going to need a more useful number that we can work with and that is the electron volt. The electron volt is defined as the energy acquired by an electron when it passes through a potential difference of one volt. The conversion factor is as follows. If we're going from electron volts to joules, we multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. If we're going from a joule to an electron volt, we divide by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. So for instance, in the example that we had above, we calculated an energy of the photon of 3.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. Now this will be equal to 2.3 electron volts. Notice how here, because I'm going from joules to electron volts, I've divided by the elementary charge and I've got a much more manageable number of 2.3 electron volts. If I'm going the other way around, then perhaps for a calculation, I want to go from, let's say, 5 electron volts to joules, then I need to multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. A good way to remember which way, uh, whether you're multiplying or whether you're dividing, is as a rule of thumb, if you can see the electron charge, if you can see this E, you multiply by this E. And if you don't, you divide. Okay guys, so let's talk about the photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect occurs when a photon of sufficient energy interacts with the surface of a metal and it releases a photoelectron from its surface. Now this is one particular proof of the particle, also known as the particulate nature of EM radiation. And this is really, really important. If in fact, wave theory predicts the photoelectric effect, however, it cannot explain the fact that the emission occurs virtually instantly. And this is one of the most important statements. So if you could remember one statement from this video, uh, I would like you to remember this one. Hope you remember quite a bit more, but this is a really, really important one that the emission occurs almost, almost instantly, whereas wave theory predicts that the emission would actually take a considerable amount of time. So in order to study the photoelectric effect, we need to define a few quantities. The first one is the work function. That is the minimum amount of energy required to release an electron from the surface of a metal. We could also define the threshold frequency, which is the minimum photon frequency required to release a photon from the surface of a metal. Remember, energy is just proportional to frequency, so those two statements actually signify the equation E is equal to HF. Because phi, the work function, is nothing but energy normally measured in joules or uh, electron volts, then we could just write that phi, the threshold uh, energy in a way, the work function, the minimum amount of energy, is going to be equal to Planck's constant H multiplied by the threshold frequency F0. Here is the photoelectric effect in a nutshell. If the energy of the photon is greater than the work function, an electron will be emitted. If the energy of the photon is less than the work function, no electrons are going to be emitted. Number three, and that's a really, really important one, is that there is a one-to-one -one interaction between electrons and photons. What does this third statement actually mean? Let's demystify it. There's a one-to-one -one interaction between electrons and photons. So this means that for to use some lower energy photons, let's draw a few over here, like so. So these guys over here have a lot less energy compared to, let's say, this UV photon over here. So these could be visible light, for instance. We never get, let's say, three photons interacting with one electron and releasing it. That does not happen. There is a one-to-one -one interaction between a photon and an electron. So this means that even if we use some very intense 
light, let's say visible light, which is below the work function um, of this metal, then we'll never get any electrons out. And this is another fact which is completely unexplained by classical physics, and it also supports the particle nature of light. One experiment to demonstrate the photoelectric effect is the gold leaf electroscope. We begin by charging a gold leaf with normally a plastic rod. We're literally bringing some charge to the surface of this plate. Normally it's a zinc plate, but it could be a plate made out of other metals. So charge is accumulated and due to electrostatic repulsion, the gold leaf is going to rise. If there are electrons here and there are electrons here, they're going to repel each other because negative particles repel each other. Exactly the same reason why uh, your hair would rise if you were to touch the, um, the surface of a Van de Graaff generator. Now, what happens if we were to shine some visible light onto the zinc plate? If we use visible light, no electrons are emitted as the photon energy is below the work function. Remember, the work function is the minimal energy required to release a electron from the surface of a metal. And essentially, the photons of visible light, as they're arriving, they just don't have enough energy. Even if we use a lot of these photons, by increasing the intensity of the visible light, no electrons will be emitted as there is a one-to-one -one interaction between photons and electrons. However, if we were to use UV light, something very interesting is going to happen. If we use UV light, the photon energy will be considerably greater than the work function. So this means that the individual photons of UV light have a lot more energy than the ones for visible light. These are great in the work function and they're going to release some electrons. So just to summarize, if we were to use visible light, no electrons will be emitted as the photon energy is below the work function. However, if we were to use UV light, the photon energy is greater than the work function, so the photoelectrons will be emitted. And because those electrons will be emitted, then this would mean that the gold leaf will going, is going to drop. So if we use UV light, the gold leaf does not drop. If we use UV light, the gold leaf drops and it drops almost instantly. If we were to bring the source closer, so let's see if I can manage that. Look at that. As soon as I bring the source closer, just about, second try, if I was to bring it closer, then more photons are going to be striking the surface. Therefore, more electrons are going to be emitted. Just a little note for to insert a piece of uh, glass, let's say a piece of glass just over here in front of the source, essentially between the source and the zinc plate, then no electrons will be emitted because glass has this property to absorb UV radiation. Let's summarize three important conclusions about the photoelectric effect from the gold leaf experiment. Number one, the emission of photons depends only on the frequency of the light or the frequency of the EM radiation, not on the intensity. The electron emission is almost instantaneous, which means that the EM radiation must have a particle of particular nature. Finally, there is a one-to-one -one interaction between photons and electrons. What we need to revise next is Einstein's equation. This is actually just a statement of conservation of energy. The energy before an interaction will be equal to the total energy after the interaction. Let's think about this. Before the interaction, we just have a photon which is flying at the speed of light towards the surface of a metal. The energy of that photon is normally given by HF. Now, some of that energy will go into releasing the electron, so it has to be at least equal to the work function. So I'm going to write the work function over here. However, the electron with, that has been released also is going to have some kinetic energy, and this is our maximum kinetic energy. So I'm going to say that this is equal to the work function plus 
Ke max, where Ke max is just the maximum kinetic energy. Because there are several ways to write the energy of a photon before, we could also rewrite exactly the same equation as hc over lambda will be equal to phi plus k max. Sometimes we may even be given the energy of the photon before, either in electron volts or in joules. So we could also say that the energy of the photon is equal to phi plus ke max. Let's do a little example. We have a material which has a work function of 2.1 electron volts. What we need to do is find the maximum speed of the photoelectron that has been emitted if a photon of energy 3.5 electron volts strikes the surface. So remember the energy of the photon so is going to equal the work function plus k max. Now hf is going to be phi plus k max. And it's really important that this whole quantity hf is equal to the energy of the photon, which is this quantity. The reason why I write this formula is hf is equal to phi plus k max rather than E photon is equal to phi plus k max is simply because this is the way the formula is given in the formula sheet for an exam. So HF is going to be uh, 3.5 electron volts and this will equal the work function which is 2.1 electron volts plus Ke max, the maximum kinetic energy. Rearranging for the maximum kinetic energy we're going to get that this is equal to 3.5 minus 2.1 EV and um, so this will be equal to 1.4 electron volts. Now because we're looking for the speed we need to convert that from electron volts to joules in order to get our answer in meters per second. So this will be equal to 1.4 multiplied by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. This gives us 2.24 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. Now this is the kinetic energy in our problem. The question is asking us to find the maximum speed. Okay, well, let's do that. I'm just going to use the formula for kinetic energy. I'm going to say that Ke is equal to a half mv squared. Well, we already know the value for the kinetic energy, so all we need to do is rearrange for v, which is the maximum speed, where this is k max. Let's remain consistent. So our maximum speed would be equal to the square root of 2ke max divided by the mass of the individual electrons, which is given in our formula sheet. So this will be equal to the square root of 2.24 times 10 to the power of minus 19. And then we're going to be and dividing that, ooh, let's multiply this by 2, which is just this 2 over here, just written it over there. Now, let's divide it by the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms. Once again, this is given in our formula booklet. And let's put this into a scientific calculator. So the square root of 2.24 times 10 to the power of minus 19 multiplied by 2 divided by 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31. 31, and this is going to give us about 7.0 times 10 to the power of 5 meters per second. So 7.0 times 10 to the power of 5 meters. Why are we talking about the maximum kinetic energy? We always write down Einstein's equation as HF is equal to phi, the work function, plus the maximum kinetic energy, and not just the kinetic energy. Well, it turns out the work function, as we said, is the minimum amount of energy required for an electron to escape the surface of the metal. And most electrons require more energy in the work function to escape the surface of the electron.
Here is an interesting question. Why are we talking about the maximum kinetic energy? We always write down Einstein's equation as HF is equal to phi, the work function, plus the maximum kinetic energy, and not just the kinetic energy. Well, it turns out the work function, as we said, is the minimum amount of energy required for an electron to escape the surface of the metal, and most electrons require more energy in the work function to escape the surface. Some electrons are just closer to the surface of the metal, meaning that they would require less energy. Let's say that the first layer of electrons require the work function amount of energy in order to escape the surface. If some electrons are deeper into the metal, they will require more energy to do so. Occasionally, we might be faced with a graph and a question in which we have the kinetic energy on the y-axis against the frequency on the x-axis. Now, let's perform y equals mx plus c analysis for this particular situation. As always, we're going to start off by writing down the equation for this case, which is Einstein's equation, which links those quantities. HF is equal to phi, the work function, plus k max. Our first step would be to rearrange for whatever quantity is on the y-axis. In this case, this is ke max. So let's rearrange that. We're going to get that ke max will be equal to HF minus the work function. We're ready to perform y equals mx plus c analysis. So what I'm going to do is write down y is equal to mx plus c. And then we're going to see, no pun intended, once again, that the negative work function is our intercept. So let's write this down. Uh, c, our intercept, is equal to negative phi. We're going to see that our k max is on the y-axis and if the frequency is on the x-axis, so those two quantities are like that, what we're left over for the gradient m is Planck's constant. So in this configuration, k max on the y-axis, frequency of the x-axis, our intercept is the negative work function and our gradient is equal to Planck's constant. So our final topic to revise is wave-particle duality. Let's start off with electron diffraction. Scientists discovered essentially by accident that electrons which are typically thought to behave as pure particles or were thought to behave as pure particles have wave-like properties. How did they discover that? First off, by heating up electrons and in order to do so you need some accelerating PD. Normally it's a high voltage power supply of the order of a few thousand volts, for instance 5,000 volts. This serves essentially as a source of high energy electrons. Occasionally some of these electrons from the hot filament would escape and they would start going through this electron diffraction tube. When they accelerate and they start moving, well, then you can place a uh, piece of polycrystalline graphite in front of them. And when this happens, they can strike the screen. Now, something amazing is um, is observed when the electrons pass through the graphite sheet and that is that they produce a diffraction pattern so electron diffraction is a visible pattern in the laboratory which uh, essentially tells you that matter has wave-like properties. The equation for the wavelength of the electron is given by the Broglie's formula, and that is that the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant H, 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34, divided by the momentum of the particle P. So once again, P here stands for momentum, and H is just Planck's constant. The wavelength in general is going to be quite small because Planck's constant h is very small. Remember the equation for momentum is mv, so this means that the wavelength will be equal to h divided by mv. 
Okay guys, well those were the main points out of the Edo physics specification on quantum physics. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video and even more importantly that you have found this useful. Let me know if you'd like to see more of these and thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.